Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Stop Advanced Adversaries with the Top 5 Critical Controls. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of this webcast today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check that your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset is on to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentation will be using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you're experiencing technical difficulty, please click on the help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console and covers most common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And feel free to submit comments via this widget as well. Lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand webcast and the slide deck. So now let's get on with the presentation. Our presenter today is Travis Smith, Principal Security Researcher at Tripwire. So now, without further delay, I'm going to hand it over to Travis. Take it away, Travis. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everybody. Uh, so today I would like to talk about how we can stop advanced adversaries. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to go over some of the common attacks and some of the most uh, high-profile attacks that we've seen over the past few years uh, and kind of describe how the attacks happened, some of the lessons learned uh, on how we could prevent attacks like this in the future, uh, and how this all relates to some of the, uh, the top critical security controls that are available at our disposal. Um, so without further ado, we'll just hop right into it. The first one I'm going to talk about today is the OPM attack. So this OPM attack, uh, Office of Personnel Management, uh, happened back in 2014 through 2015. Uh, what happened is there were a little over 20 million government employee records that were stolen from the Office of Personal Management. So anybody that had any type of government clearance uh, had their personal information stolen, background check information, fingerprint data, and, and so uh, so this is a, a long, slow, drawn-out attack that happened over the course of a few years that had a couple of different stages and a couple of different attack vectors um, to get in there. So here's how it, it happened in the timeline of what happened. Um, so here's a, a network diagram of the uh, Office of Personnel Management, very detailed. Um, so what happened is in March of 2014 timeframe, their network blueprints were stolen from their environment. So the, the attack vector to get those out is, is currently unknown, at least it's not publicly known. So from these network diagrams, they're able to profile the environment, see what, where their vulnerabilities were, how they can pivot across the environment, and uh, figure out what their attack motive was going to be. Um, so shortly after they stole them, a couple months after, June 2014, a third-party vendor uh, had a phishing attack against them and was able to steal their credentials. So with those credentials, they were able to gain access into the environment and start placing malware across their environment likely attacking a, a desktop system and uh, pivoting across that uh, user environment and then finally up into the server environment. After that happened, uh, we saw some uh, uh, domain names that were registered. Uh, one of them was opmlearning.org, uh, which is not associated with uh, OPM at all. And one of the, the curious things, and actually it's a little bit funny, that this domain was registered to a man named Steve Rogers. And for any uh, comic book fans out there, Steve Rogers is uh, Captain America. So a little bit of a, a, a way that these uh, criminals were using you know, comic book characters to, to register their domain names. So after they had that, uh, they used this domain name to start dealing, uh, stealing data out and start um, exfiltrating it from the environment. Um, so between July and August of 2014, uh, some security clearance data was stolen from the environment. Um, then shortly after that, the personnel records were stolen. So through, you know, essentially from June all the way up until the end of 2014 is when the bulk of the, the data was uh, finally stolen out. Then, you know, we saw more uh, domains being registered. This one, wcnews.post.com, was registered and used exclusively for this one here. Uh, and this is where the uh, fingerprint data was stolen in March of 2014. 
And then right around April 2014, they started decrypting all of the SSL traffic at their perimeter and inspecting what was going in and out of their environment. Once they did that, uh, they started seeing you know weird DNS requests and weird SSL requests going out of the environment to things like OPM Learning or WCNewsPost.com, uh, which was data that was being you know exfiltrated that shouldn't have. Um, so they you know they cut off that access uh, and then you know in April 2015 and it was able to you know get all the malware out of their environment. So you know what happened here and you know what are the lessons learned as far as you know how do you prevent prevent against this type of thing. Uh, this is a common attack vector for people getting in is that third-party vendor or a trusted insider being able to get access to the environment. Um, so the best thing to do is just try to get rid of that uh, malicious uh, external user, whether that's a third-party vendor or an uh, inside user. Uh, the best way to do that, strong passwords and two-factor authentication. So even if there are, uh, was a phishing attack and they did lose their password, they still have that second factor of authentication. Uh, next is being able to protect all your environments a little bit better to prevent that malware. Uh, you know, here at Tripwire we have TE and Tripwire Enterprise, uh, which can inspect things for change and be able to alert on malicious things. Uh, we also have Tripwire Log Center, so we can collect logs from your environment and correlate this information together where we see, uh, you know, traffic going to weird things like OPM learning, which it shouldn't be, or uh, files being placed on critical servers during a closed change window event. Um, so there's a couple of different things that we can do to try to protect against that. So, um, you know, beyond that, things like network segmentation and uh, proper you know, hygiene across the environment is, is critical for being able to protect against even advanced attack. Uh, the next one I want to get into is the target breach from 2013. Um, so in February, not February, sorry, in November of 2013, uh, the, the retail registers at uh, targets across the United States were infected with a memory scraping piece of malware, uh, which over the course of Black Friday and a few days, you know, a few days and a few weeks after, stole 40 million credit card numbers. Um, so let's get into kind of what, what happened here. So again, uh, you know, we have their network environment here. Same thing, a third party vendor, in this case was a HVAC vendor, um, had a phishing attack against them and stole their credentials to be able to gain a foothold into their environment. Um, so this was in, uh, I believe, November 15th is when they were finally able to get into their environment. So between November 15th and November 28th of 2013, uh, they were able to infiltrate the network and then begin instil uh, installing malware. So what they did is they took over their patch management solution system. Uh, and deployed a malicious patch to all of their kiosk machines. <coughs> Excuse me. So, that what you know, masquerading as a official Windows patch was installing all of these. You know, what looked like a Windows patch was actually the memory scraping malware. And this happened over the course of the Black Friday weekend, which for anybody that's in a retail environment is a huge red flag. You do not introduce any change. Uh, oh, you know, definitely not on the night before Black Friday, and definitely not over the whole holiday season. You don't want to. Uh, risk taking your registers offline. Um, so this happened between November 27th and December 15th. Uh, stole all of this data um, and what the memory uh, scraping malware actually did is on each individual point of sale machine uh, wrote the credit card files, uh, sorry, credit card numbers to a DLL file in the system 32 directory uh, and then uploaded that to a staging server local within the target account, uh, sorry, the target network. Um, and then during uh, you know, once a day um, or even once a week, what it would do is then just upload those DLL files from the staging server to a FTP uh, server owned by the criminals. So, um, you know, what we, what we can do to prevent this type of thing, um, again, the first step is locking down that uh, access from the outside environment using two-factor authentication and strong password. Uh, does, again, doesn't matter if the password is stolen, having that second factor of authentication is critical. Uh, the same thing, is monitoring for change across the environment, uh, looking for malicious patches that are coming in uh, outside of a patch window, looking for uh, events that are happening, uh, you know, DLL files that are being written to a point of sale machine when there's no change that should be there, uh, or even a DLL file that's being introduced to a machine um, outside of a patch management window. Um, being able to look at uh, known good versus known bad, um, so wh whether that file is a DLL file or an executable file or even a text file. Uh, being able to see um, you know, this file is being placed on the machine, um, being able to know that a file has been placed on a machine, and then say, okay, is this file expected? Is this part of a, a proper Windows patch or it's not? Okay, well, I can 
<laughs> excuse me, I can leverage uh, you know, threat intelligence services and say, okay, well, this file is known to be bad, or this file is just completely unknown. Uh, let me just get it off my environment for now. Let me quarantine it, and I can and do some actual manual IR uh, response there. Um, all right, the next one I want to go over is the uh, power outage in Ukraine. So this is the more recent attack of the three uh, that I want to talk about today. Uh, so in late 2015, December 2015, uh, there was a cyber attack against a power utility in Ukraine. Um, and what this did is completely knock out power for uh, estimated anywhere between 80 to 200,000 citizens within the country of Ukraine. So um, how did this happen? How did this work? Okay, so the first step is what they did is they, in March 2015, started a, a spear phishing campaign. And what they were doing is targeting the engineers within the control system. Um, so just a, a typical phishing campaign, this time instead of going against a third-party user, they were going against the actual internal employees, which is a common attack that we see every day, uh, even here at Tripwire. Uh, once they gained that foothold uh, from the uh, machine here, they were able to install a piece of malware called Black Energy 3, uh, which had a couple different components here. So Black Energy 3 was the command and control system um, that allowed them to gain access. Uh, they installed uh, Kill Disk, which allowed them to wipe over everything, um, and then installed a remote access Trojan as well. So they had this whole access into their environment. So what they did is they knocked over all of the substations and they turned them all off. Um, they made it look like the engineers that were looking at the front of the screen. To them, it looked like nothing was going wrong. They saw business as usual on their screen. In the background, the kill disk malware was completely wiping out their environment. What I actually really like about this um, attack, what they did, is they were doing a denial of service attack against their support center as well. So any users, when their power went out, they were not able to contact support. So not only were the engineers not able to see that the power was going out, but also the customers um, that had the power out weren't able to report it to the customer service uh, department as well. All right, so um, some of the things that uh, we can do to prevent this one, um, this one's a little bit uh, you know, trickier here, but there's things that we can control on that machine. So number one is being able to harden uh, your systems as best as possible, specifically, uh, you know, low change systems, you know, not talking about endpoints, but talking about servers or, uh, you know, ICS type uh, servers that are controlling physical hardware. Um, you know, once you have it locked down completely, uh, very minimal change, do, you know, change audit across the entire environment, see what's changing because nothing should be changing. And using whitelisting technologies, uh, if you're, you know, in the Windows environment, things like AppLocker or there's any number of uh, products out there that do app, uh, sorry, application whitelisting. So only allow these specific applications to run and execute, and anything outside of that uh, don't allow it to execute. Um, it's not a silver bullet. You know, there's things like built-in Windows tool, PowerShell, which still can be, uh, you know, exploited against, but it uh, greatly reduces the attack surface to a manageable level. Then the last one I want to talk about, you know, is in a galaxy very far, far away. There is, you know, unplanned change introduced by a Jedi, which caused tremendous amount of damage. Right? So, how do we stop these? Um, so, the the critical security controls are available from the Center for Internet Security. Um, these are the controls formerly known as the SANS Top 20. So, there are 20 critical security controls that they that they publish. Uh, there are five, which they consider the, you know, the, they're the top five for a reason. Um, and what I want to do today is kind of get into these top five and uh, describe why they can prevent attacks like the ones we just saw here, uh, which were, you know, attacked from, you know, these criminals which are very, very well funded, very knowledgeable, and have um, a lot of uh, power behind them to try to break into your environment. The goal of these things, of, you know, these critical security controls is to know what your attack surface is. Everybody has an attack surface. Um, so, you know, critical security uh, control, CSC1 and CSC2, uh, this is really about knowing what your attack surface is. You can't protect uh, what you don't know that you have. Once you know your attack surface, you want to use something like CSC3 um, for hardening your environment and shrinking your attack surface to as small as possible. You can never get rid of it completely, but you want to get it down to a very manageable level. Uh, once you know your attack surface is being able to monitor it, so things like vulnerability scanning from CSC4, uh, or you know, doing uh, uh, SIEM, SEM, and log management to monitor your environment to be able to see you know where the the risk the highest risk 
profiles in your environment to be able to monitor those much more closely because that's where attackers are going to be getting in. So, you know, the three common themes here is know your attack surface, shrink your attack surface, and monitor your attack surface. Let's get into each one individually. So there are sub uh, bullet uh, items for each critical security control. So here for critical security control one for monitor, you know, inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices. So this is just knowing what hardware you have on your environment. So there's six different sub bullet items here. Uh, so you know, there's multiple ones for each con control, but I'm going to outline the ones which I consider the, the most critical um, that you'd want to be able to implement. Uh, that's not saying these other ones are less critical or less uh, effective. Uh, these are the ones that just have a lower co uh, cost of entry to implement and are going to have a higher return on investment. Um, so for critical security control one, uh, this is um, essentially knowing what hard you, hardware you have. So maintaining an asset inventory consisting of your IP addresses, machine names, um, you know, that's very easy to do. You can do that uh, with you know, open source tools like Nmap where there's you know actual commercial tools which can gather all this stuff uh, as well, but being able to add metadata to that, so the purpose of the machine, who owns it, the asset, you know, asset owner, the department that it belongs to, uh, can give context later on whether you are uh, providing information to an auditor or you have, um, you know, an incident that you need to respond to and you need to have, you know, some context around the event. Uh, you know, using things like a, a automated asset inventory discovery tool, very, very, very key. Uh, you don't want to be doing this manually. Uh, you can pull stuff from DHCP, uh, but you know that's going to leave you blind to somebody that got on your environment with a static IP address. Um, you know, adding the equipment manually to a um, a new inventory system, you know, 1.3 uh, is cool and it's nice. But uh, from experience, uh, things can be lost. You don't add in something. Uh, it can be a step that is overlooked very easily when you're deploying new hardware. Um, you know, 802.1x is a very very nice tool. Um, very. Uh, good if you want to if you're worried about keeping you know rogue devices off your network, but it can be very difficult to implement. You know there are tools out there that make that less painful, but uh, it's still quite a bit of a, a struggle to get that deployed. So from you know the Tripwire's uh, perspective, here's kind of how we expose that data. You know this is a, a screenshot from our IP360 tool. Uh, you know showing things like host names and IP addresses, the the server type. Um, so you know this is the the same thing from 1.4, your IP address and your machine name. Um, and we, you know, we give a little bit more context from the, the scans that it's doing, but it's essentially just exposing that data and having a, uh, a record of what these devices are. Uh, we have another tool called the CCM, Configuration Compliance Manager, which is just another uh, way to slice the same pie, um, just exposing that type of information. And this one gives you a little bit more detailed information, so uh, your BIOS or CPU information, so it can give it some reports on, on your actual hardware. Uh, but again, is this another tool to collect the same type of data? And the goal for you know CSC one is just you know collecting data so it can be searched or referenced later. So just knowing this stuff is there isn't a security precaution uh, protection me uh, mechanism in itself. It's not going to stop an attacker, uh, but it's going to allow you to be able to respond to an event much faster. Okay, uh, so critical security control two. Um, so CSC two um, is to software what CSC one is to hardware. So this is just knowing after you know what devices you have on your environment, knowing what software is running on there. So having uh, not only the software list but also the version uh, of what that software is uh, is going to be great. Um, then number two dot two is one that is probably the most critical uh, of all this one is deploying application whitelisting. So things like AppLocker and Windows or you know other premium security tools. So know what you have, know what should be running on the environment, and only allow that to run on the environment. Um, uh, you know, doing things like air gapping uh, from 2.4 is is nice, um, and it can stop a lot of attacks. Uh, again, it's not a silver bullet. You know, just like white uh, whitelisting is not a silver bullet. Uh, you know, we have attacks like Stuxnet, which can get around air gap systems. So from the you know the tripwire perspective here is you know another screenshot of one of my assets uh, that IP360 has discovered uh, you know where I can have um, on the top here the, the asset information IP address and host name and things like that um, but the the list of all the software which is running on there which is just not only the you know the software name but the software version uh, which gives you a lot of uh, critical information um, so let's say a new vulnerability hits uh, something like a heart bleed or a shell shock. Um, you don't need to go through and scan your entire environment to see if your environment is vulnerable to shell shock when the you know the CIO is asking you know what is our risk exposure to this vulnerability. 
um, by knowing all of these vulnerabilities, you know what your attack surface is, you know what your versions are on there. So when OpenSSL 1.1 has a vulnerability um, and you, need, you know you need to be on OpenSSL 1.2, you can just do a search for all versions of OpenSSL you know, 1.1 or lower and then very quickly without having to do a full scan or a full authenticated scan, uh, which can take um, you know, hours or days depending on how large your environment is, uh, you can get that response back within some Uh, and again, another way to expose that same type of data from our uh, Configuration and Compliance Manager tool, uh, this is just another way to say there's a hundred different ways to skin a cat, but you just need to get that information out there. So being able to collect that information and being able to report on that information, uh, again, isn't going to uh, stop an attacker, but it's going to allow you to know where your attackers are going to you know, target yourself uh, and what your risk exposure is, just knowing your attack surface. Once we get into the third critical security control, this is CSC3, um, this is more about shrinking your attack surface down. So now we're going to start getting into how we can prevent an attacker from getting into your environment. Um, so there's a couple different uh, you know, bullet points here which I highlighted instead of just one. So the first one um, that I highlight is using configuration management policies. So uh, the CIS uh, is the one that's deploying the critical security controls now. They're the ones that are managing it. Uh, so they say, you know, use the CIS benchmarks. But there are other ones out there. Uh, if you're a government entity um, doing you know, government work, you're going to want to follow the uh, benchmarks. Uh, but using some type of authoritative source of saying, here's how you lock down a, uh, a system, whether that's a desktop or a uh, Linux server or a, um, you know, an application to a, an iPhone. Uh, there's authoritative things that say, do these steps to be able to prevent the most common types of attacks. Once you follow those, um, I would actually put that before 3.1. So 3.1 is using, essentially just to have a golden image and use that to deploy your machines. Um, this is just more about an operational thing to, to save uh, time. Um, so I would say your golden image should be already locked down um, from 3.2. So use a you know, benchmark like CIS or DIS. So lock down the golden image and use that to deploy that to your, your endpoints. You have to go through uh, implementing all of these uh, benchmarks, which can take a lot of time. Uh, then just use uh, FIM, which is File Integrity Monitoring, to monitor for change. So monitoring for changes against images to making sure nobody is installing a, you know, a backdoor into your images or um, you know, modifying images without you knowing. Uh, using FIM to monitor critical system files, so after those images have already been deployed to servers or endpoints, uh, know where your critical files are, what your critical applications are. Uh, and what, uh, you know, the configuration items which can be changed to, you know, increase your attack surface. Uh, monitor those for change so you can be able to detect if an attacker is trying to gain a foothold in your environment or expand a foothold and gain persistence to try to exfiltrate data. Uh, this is a common uh, attack vector and this is a, you know, very fundamental detection mechanism using, you know, monitoring for change uh, which can detect these things uh, very, very quickly. So from, you know, if we look at a, a benchmark, so there's CIS, which is the Center for Internet Security, uh, and there's DISA. So CIS is uh, just a bunch of PDFs which are available on the, you know, CIS website, which you can get. And then, a, you know, the DISA comes and, you know, they have a cool little Java viewer which, which allows you to view them. But they all essentially do the same thing. There's a lot of overlap between the two. You don't need to, uh, you know, do one and then do the other. If you do one, you're probably 80, 90 percent of the way of doing um, covering things, you know, desktop, servers, network devices, operating systems, uh, you know, server software, applications, you know, desktop software like, you know, Office or, um, you know, web browsers, that kind of thing. There's a lot of different things that you can apply to your environment. Um, but, you know, I went through and I uh, have, a, you know, I'm a glutton for pain, so I implemented a Center for Internet Security for Windows 7, and it took a long time. So there were um, a little over 200 tests um, to, to implement, and there are over 200 tests for each uh, Windows uh, uh, configuration benchmark. Um, so if you look at uh, the way they break it down, they're scored versus not scored. So the scored ones are the most critical. Um, on an average of about five minutes to, to check and see if it's already configured, um, and then if it's not configured, to modify the setting and then recheck it to make sure it got set. It took about five minutes per test. So you extrapolate that out to 155 tests. Uh, that is a little over 13 hours per device to implement this stuff. Uh, and then if you add in the not scored, that's another 85 tests, adds another seven hours. That's going to be you know, a total of 20 hours for a full-time engineer to go through and manually implement a configuration benchmark. Uh, which can take you know a lot of time. 
So you want to automate this as best as possible uh, so you don't have to spend 20 hours. You can just do a click of a button and get your going. Um, but even you don't even have to get up to that 100% uh, you know, benchmark. The BIS recommends at least 80% because we know that the 100% you know, security isn't going to you know, work in every environment. Every environment is unique, and you need to disable some you know, security settings to allow the business to operate. You're going to have compensating controls to be able to. So if we look at, you know, here's what the 80% benchmark is. So that's what um, you know, CIS recommends is say, you know, try to get it at least to this point. Um, by going through manually, you're going to go through. It's going to take a lot of time. You're going to finally get up to that 80%. Uh, or 100% or whatever your goal is, uh, and then you're going to pat yourself on the back and go get a cup of coffee. Um, and then over time, that's going to start dipping down. There's a couple of reasons why. Uh, so maybe um, you install a new server application and you need to disable a security setting to be able to enable that application to run. Um, or let's say uh, you know, another benchmark gets updated. So these benchmarks are released constantly. Uh, we're, we're constantly analyzing which ones are out there, and then it's it's monthly, there, there's new versions released. Um, and then there's going to be new protections that are going to be uh, added, new new tests that you need to test against. And without even knowing it, your security is going to continually drop down below that 80% that, uh, or whatever your mark is. Um, then we can have something uh, which I call the uh, let's keep the auditor happy scanning, uh, where you go through and you get yourself up to your security for, you know, maybe a PCI audit and say, okay, you know, here, auditor, here is our environment scan. We're up to good, you know, we're we're good, and you can give us your passing grade. Um, and then, you know, things change while the auditor's gone, and then they're going to come back in the next quarter or the next year, and you have to do another mega scan. Let's reassess. Let's figure out where we're at. Uh, let's, uh, you know, rechange these settings, get back up to where we need to be so we can pass our audit. And it's just this annual wave of cycles um, that is, uh, just a lot of overhead, which you don't want to be doing. Uh, it's very uh, laborious to do this type of thing, and it's actually very dangerous because you can uh, implement a lot of, uh, introduce a lot of risk to your environment that is unnecessary. Uh, so what you want to do is use an automated tool to continuously check for configuration, um, to make sure that you are at that point, uh, and if you're not at the security level you want to be, uh, and you need to make a change, you can just automatically. Uh, introduce a remediation guidance, okay, um, pass this off to an operations uh, engineer and they can go make that change manually. Or let me click a button and get that going um, to, to change that configuration setting for me. So you just have these little dips and say, okay, security went down, let me get it back up. Security went down, let me get it back up. Um, makes, um, you know, makes this be a force amplifier for uh, your operations team and uh, will make your life a lot easier. So let me look at you know show you why this is gonna why you want to do automation. So this is a very simple uh, test from a Windows desktop uh, benchmark configuration, which essentially just says make sure you have the Windows firewall enabled. Right? It sounds simple enough, uh, but here's why it takes so long to to test it, configure it, and recheck it. Right? So you want to go to your group policy and make sure that the Windows firewall setting is set to enabled. So we can see here that you know the the top level there, protect all network connections is not configured. So you're going to have to drill down in this uh, network tree or the directory structure tree on the left, find where you need to be. See, it's not set to not configured. All right, let me double click that, set it to enabled. Okay, well, let me go to the registry and see, you know, what happened. Uh, you, you crawl through the registry hive and you find out where that setting actually lives, uh, and you realize uh, there's no key here. So even though it's set to enabled in the group policy, um, the registry is the one that is actually enforcing it on the local machine, whether that's from the local uh, group policy or if that's from a domain group policy. Okay, well, let me just make sure that is in there. Okay, the enable firewall, that key exists. Okay, that key exists. Okay, that key, what's the key value? The key value is one, that's what it should be. Um, and that key value should match that this is enabled. Okay, it's finally set, it's finally Im uh, implemented. This is why it takes so long to do a configuration scan. Yeah, Tripwire, we can just do all that for you manually. We can check the group policy setting, we can check the, the registry keys, make sure they exist, make sure what the values are. Uh, and then give a you know a timeline and a you know a snapshot in time of what your policy and security structure is like according to these authoritative sources. So uh, from a per host basis, per per network basis, per per entire uh, deployment of your infrastructure basis. Okay, here is what my security posture looks like. Here's how it's increased or decreased or stayed steady over the course of uh, whatever your timeline needs to be. Whether you need to show an auditor, whether whether you need to show the CIO. Um, or whether you just need peace of mind um, to, to sleep at night to know that your security is uh, up to snuff.
even when something dips out of security, um, we can do simple reports here of, okay, for this asset or these set of assets, uh, you know, here's what the security posture looks like. You're just a little over halfway there. Um, you know, let me show you what those failed tests are. So on the right-hand side here, we can say, okay, uh, here are the whole list of tests that have failed, uh, and here's why they failed. Uh, whether the setting is disabled, the file is not there, configuration is off, and whatever, whatever that may be. Uh, here are step-by-step -step, uh, instructions to configure your environment to make sure that this test now passed. So this is something you'd pass off to a you know, low-level operations analyst or engineer to say, you know, do this on these systems. Uh, and then come back to me and tell me when that's done. Um, you know, not every environment is uh, the same. So whether you have custom configurations, you have uh, your own custom policies, or you want to uh, add additional guidance, uh, you can edit the, the steps for remediation that you see in here. Um, and, you know, this is the instructions that are passed off in the report that you can pass off to the engineer to say, you know, go do this um, to, to make everybody's life a little bit easier. Um, if you don't want to do that manually, um, we do offer something that we call auto remediation. So just run this script, um, you know, be a failure, click this button, or automatically do something to, to make that change. So in this case here, we're, um, you know, if, if that Windows firewall is not enabled, if the, the GPO key is not set and that, that registry key isn't there, if that registry key is there and it's the wrong value, uh, go through and implement it so we have the firewall enabled um, and it just does it automatically for you. So this is going to be, allow you to, to get a lot more done a lot more quickly. So just, you know, click button the compliance remediation, very easy to do. Okay, so now that we've uh, known what our attack surface is and we've shrunk it down as much as possible, we want to implement something um, for critical security control for. So the, the main theme for um, CSC4 is scan for vulnerabilities, uh, patch the vulnerabilities that you find, uh, and then monitor your logs for um, attacks against these types of vulnerabilities. That's very high level. So there's two of them in here that I think are the most critical. So number one is doing vulnerability scanning. Um, so this is knowing what, you know, after your attack surface has been shrunk down, knowing what your attack surface is. So this is just taking the uh, information from CSC1 and CSC2 and then applying some intelligence data to it. So knowing from what your versions are, these are the vulnerabilities associated with these. Uh, and there's ways you can get uh, even better um, information in there, reducing false positives, so doing things like authenticated vulnerability scans, deep vulnerability scans, that sh uh, which actually attempt to exploit uh, things. So even if you have a uh, vulnerable version, you could have other compensating controls, maybe didn't enable the feature that's vulnerable. Um, but, you know, at a very first level is doing a, a, a vulnerability scan and doing that automated. Um, so doing this ideally weekly uh, if you can, um, but as, as often as you, as you can to get these things out. Then once you know that, um, ideally you want to deploy the patch uh, using you know, 4.5 would as deploying patch management tools to do this for you. Uh, or, you know, even just having things set to auto-update, even though that could be a little dangerous in an enterprise environment. Uh, getting that uh, time to patch down as, as small as possible to, to attack things. But there's a lot of, you know, buzz around zero days and, and uh, these advanced attacks, but the, the reality of the, the market is that, you know, criminals aren't going to be wasting zero days on your environment. Uh, you know, they're going to be using known vulnerabilities, trying to, ex you, you know, use known exploits to, to get a, a foothold into your environment. So uh, just making your exposure as small as possible, making yourself more difficult to get into so they can just move on to their next target uh, is going to be a huge step in protecting your, your assets and your intellectual property. And the final one, which is actually very critical here, this is probably the most critical one that I would say, um, is monitor, monitor your logs and scan for activity. Uh, don't let your log management tool or your SEM be a, a data dump for logs. The logs is where all of your data and all of your uh, intelligence for your security operations live, where um, you're going to be able to detect attacks and be able to detect things that your security tools uh, missed. Um, this is critical. Make sure you're monitoring those, not only using automated tools, um, but actually having an analyst that goes in there and being able to look at things. Uh, so being able to expose this type of data. So a vulnerability scan, this is something that, you know, from a, an IP360 uh, standpoint, again, this is just looking at an asset. Instead of looking at what software is available on there, 
Um, this is saying these are the vulnerabilities, um, whether that's from, you know, this is a Microsoft system here, so we can get the, the MS bulletin number, uh, we can get the CVE information there, uh, and then being able to expose that, um, that risk profile to you. So CVSS scoring can be a little uh, misleading at times, uh, where uh, something with a CVSS score of 10 is maybe not as critical to your environment as something with a CVSS score of 5. Um, so, you know, we take a lot more into account there and uh, how we score vulnerabilities, which is why you see some there with, you know, a risk score of in the 30,000s. And finally, we get the, the critical security control 5. So, um, there's parts of CSE 5 which have been covered in previous sections. So, if you look at, you know, 5.4, 5.5, 5, um, and, you know, 5.7, these are uh, settings which, if you've already done um, critical security control 3, um, are already part of that. So most benchmarks are going to have you enable logging for administrative accounts, and they're going to have you using long passwords, which are complex. Um, so you've probably already done a lot of these. Um, so probably the, the most critical one here, we've already discussed it today, uh, is using two-factor authentication. Um, I'd expand this out not just for admin access, use two-factor authentication for every access. If people are coming in from an outside world into your environment, uh, you need to have two-factor authentication enabled. You, it's not a nice to have, that is a need to have. Um, 5.3, um, that should be a no-brainer for everybody on this call uh, listening to this webcast, is change your default passwords. There's too many attacks that are going on which are taking advantage of default passwords. Uh, you need to look at the you know, commercial side and, and the that the Mirai botnet, which is just taking over default passwords for Telnet on you know, webcams and, and cameras around the world. Um, just being able to change those is going to prevent an attacker from getting into your environment. Um, so, um, even though I already mentioned logging in, in CSE4, CSE5 is where it really uh, deep dives if you look at the details into uh, what it uses, what it means to, to monitor administrative events. Um, so here, you know, this is a, a screenshot from our Tripwire Log Center, um, but whether you have uh, any, any log management tool or a SEM tool, uh, don't let that, that be a black hole for your data. Um, using automation correlation rules is nice. Um, that's going to be able to detect things in real time that are known. Uh, you know, being able to correlate a login event um, that happened after five, you know, failed login events, and then what did they do after that event? Um, you know, what are the what actions did that user take? Right. That's an example of a very simple correlation rule. Um, but correlation rules and these machine rules uh, help that. Uh, you know, thing, detect things which are just typical attacks, which are, you know, already some type of known attack. Um, they're, you know, these are, you know, typical attack detection signatures, but your network and your environment is not typical. You need to know what business as usual looks like, and you need to be able to investigate that uh, anything that looks like business, um, that's not business as usual, Any, anything that looks like it's outside of the norm, and only uh, your security team is going to be able to, you know, know that information. You can't do an IR program all automated and all programmat uh, programmatically um, and be able to have a, you know, high level of confidence that you're detecting all of the attacks against your environment. Uh, so, you know, high level, this is kind of what uh, security is all about. You know, security is a journey. It's not a destination. Um, so we just need to have continuous monitoring, and that's, you know, continuous is not just a one-time thing, whether we're talking about uh, vulnerability scans, we're talking about patching, we're talking about you know, monitoring logs. This continuous monitoring of all these things is critical. Uh, and doing all of those things is going to be able to allow you to know your attack surface and shrink that attack surface down. Um, and then once we have that, is being able to identify changes, whether they're suspicious or not. So these are uh, new vulnerabilities that are coming out. This could be uh, file changes on your servers. This could be uh, logs coming in from your firewall. You need to know what business as usual looks like. So all these orange dots are business as usual. Um, and then being able to reduce that noise down and being able to focus your efforts on the things which are interesting, which need to be addressed uh, over uh, business as usual events. Um, that's going to be able to amplify your force and uh, get a lot more return on investment for any security tool that you implement or uh, getting higher value out of all of your uh, security team. So uh, here is a, a, a slide that is uh, given out by Gartner, and this is uh, more, um, they use this when they talk about endpoint detection and response, their EDR market, um, but I, I figure that this actually plays very well into um, uh, any security uh, deployment that you want to do. So uh, if you want to do any security, you want to have, this is a whole life cycle of it. 
Um, so we have, you know, first you want to predict things. You want to be able to, you know, essentially know what the attack is going to be and be able to prevent that. Um, so the, you know, prediction is going to continually run into itself and go through there. Um, that's going to lead off to prevent, uh, prevention, uh, hardening your systems. Um, you're going to continually harden them uh, with, as new things come out or as you get new systems. That prevention is going to lead into detection. So you want to be able to detect things as they happen. And since we know detection uh, isn't, we're not going to be able to detect everything, uh, you're going to want to be able to respond to things that you detect. And all of this intelligence just keeps feeding into themselves and feeding into each other. And that's this huge life cycle of being able to uh, protect against everything. Uh, so um, this is from the, if you look at the critical security controls, um, the, they follow what they call the Pareto principle. Um, that is 80% um, 80 80 of the effects come from 20% of the causes. Um, so if you implement just these uh, top five security controls, they estimate that that's going to block 85% of the attacks against your environment, just those top five that we've already talked about today. Uh, if you do all 20, that's going to prevent 97% uh, of all known attacks against your environment. Uh, so very quickly, you can get a uh, you know block the majority of attacks that you're going to be able to see in your environment doing, um, you know, industry best standards using these critical security controls. Um, you might be saying, well, how do I get all these critical security controls deployed? I don't, you know, that seems like a huge undertaking whether I have automated tools or not. So uh, this is a great poster that's available from the, the CIS website. There's a link here down on the bottom. Um, so this is a mapping of some of the most uh, common Compliance policies, so things like PCI or HIPAA or uh, NERC or NIST, um, and how they map to these critical security controls. So if you are already following PCI guidance, then you know that you're already um, following some of these top critical security controls at least to some point. Um, so I highly recommend you you, know, you go to the, you take a look at that if you're if you're interested in deploying some of these critical security controls. Then finally, um, I want to go over some of the uh, the research that I've done into these attacks, which aren't really covered in these uh, critical security controls. So if you're looking at hardening Windows systems, uh, these are some of the most common ways uh, that people are getting into your environment, uh, how they can exploit things and gain a foothold. And this is based off of real attacks that, that we've seen in the wild. Um, so the first one here is something called a dialogue filter. So dialogue filter is going to take default actions on dialog pop-ups. So things like uh, you want to save a PowerPoint um, as an example. What it's going to do is it's take a default action. Whenever Microsoft PowerPoint wants to you know, save anything, you can say, you know, don't save it. So that prevents anybody from saving you know, a file to your environment. Um, that's not really a security you know, protection uh, in that example. Um, a real attack example would be uh, where a user can try to force an escape of an application to gain access to an underlying operating system. Um, so you'd want to do things like a dialog filter for uh, computers which are in public locations which have unknown or untrusted people. So think things like uh, point of sale machines or kiosks, uh, hotel, uh, you know, guest computers that they can use to print out their boarding passes, that kind of thing. Um, if they have some type of application that is the default application, you don't want them getting access to the underlying operating system, dialog filter is a great way to, to help protect that. In addition to that, again, on these uh, public systems for unknown or untrusted users is the keyboard filter. Um, so what the keyboard filter does is it allows you to prevent certain keyboard combinations from being accepted by the operating system, like uh, Control-Alt-Delete uh, or F4 or Windows D. Uh, so again, trying to prevent user from escaping an application, trying to get access to the underlying operating system. There's a ton of them which are available uh, out of the box, um, but it's very easy to add custom ones as well through the registry or the or group policy. Um, so if you have public computers, I uh, highly recommend you look into both of these. Uh, one of my favorite attacks is actually quite old. Uh, this is the sticky keys attack. Um, so if anybody's on a Windows machine, uh, you've probably done this by accident. But if you just hit the shift key five times pretty quickly, that's going to prop, uh, prompt you saying, you know, do you want to enable sticky keys? Um, this is, you know, for their ease of access stuff to, you know, allow for, for people here. Um, but what it does is every time you do that, it launches an executable um, in the system32 directory, the, the setHC.exe in that, in that directory. But what's fun about that is that you can actually induce this executable from a locked computer, whether somebody's logged in or not. So if you go to a locked computer, you lock your Windows computer, hit that shift key five times, it's going to uh, open up this executable. If you're able to replace the setHC.exe with, you know, cmd.exe, for example, um, 
from a, any locked computer that you do that against, you can just hit that shift key five times, um, and then the command prompt is going to open up with system level uh, permissions on uh, that machine. Uh, so being able to you know monitor for against that, that this file never changes uh, in the history of Windows updates. Uh, I don't think it's ever been updated once. So that's, if, if this file changes, it should be a very very high uh, red flag alert in your environment. Uh, doing drive encryption for for roaming devices, um, so Windows laptops uh, that your uh, employees are taking out and about. Uh, BitLocker is the the Windows drive encryption. Um, it's nice, but it can be difficult to properly implement. Um, so, you know, there are other encryption technologies, but if there are any floating uh, laptops out there, make sure you are doing drive encryption. Uh, and then beyond that, there is a level of training that needs to be done for your employees um, to know that uh, when they are traveling with their laptops, they need to shut them down completely. So even if they, you know, if they close the lid and the, and the machine is in standby or hibernation mode, uh, the files aren't actually encrypted. You need to shut down the computer to encrypt those files to protect against uh, data being stolen from a, a laptop that is you know, lost from your environment. Um, so USB filtering has been something that's been uh, a pain point for me for a long time in my security career, um, both from a, uh, a vendor as, a, as well as a um, deployer of security uh, and environment. There are you know, ways you can do this manually, things like uh, disabling the BIOS, um, which will disable the entire port, uh, which is probably the, the most foolproof way to do this. Um, or there are, you know, system level drivers that can be deployed with security tools which will uh, intercept driver calls to the, to the USB driver and, and try to do some logic on that. Um, but from my, you know, personal experience with, with drivers uh, intercepting USB calls, it can be, you know, a lot of BSODs and a lot of uh, crashes on your environment, which isn't nice. I was surprised to see that there's two files on the Windows directory uh, called, you know, USB store.pnf and INF. And all you have to do is just disable um, access from specific users and they'll not, you know, they'll be prevented from installing or plugging in any USB storage device, uh, external hard drive, USB stick, that kind of thing. Uh, it just won't mount at all. They can still use peripherals, keyboards, and mice, um, but they just won't be able to do that. So a very granular way you can just uh, prevent people from doing uh, USB filter. Uh, EMET is a security tool from Microsoft, really, really good tool. Um, in my experience, one of the best at preventing uh, Metasploit attacks on your environment. So uh, out of the security tools I've tested, this one caught every single uh, meterpreter attack against my environment um, without uh, any failure. Uh, the problem being with uh, EMET is that can be very difficult to manage. Uh, if you, uh, you know, there's a lack of wildcard support, when if you, so you can't just say protect everything on the environment. You have to list it all um, either at, a, at the very least at a directory level. Um, so being able to crawl the entire environment is something you'd have to do. Uh, it's a, a an XML structure is a policy structure for EMET. Uh, so if this is something that you'd be interested in doing, it's very easy to just crawl the entire environment to get the, that directory structure and build a policy. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, let me know after this webcast, and I can and walk you through how I've done that uh, to automatically deploy EMET across the environment. Uh, AppLocker, we've talked about that today already. Um, that's the Windows whitelisting technology, which can uh, block executables on three different levels of uh, policies. Uh, the first one is Publisher, which is looking at the certificate uh, that the file is signed by. So it needs to be signed by a, a file uh, by a using a certificate that is trusted by the system. Uh, and it, once it's trusted by the system, it just looks at the name. Um, so there are attacks against that. I did a talk at Sector last year if you're interested in seeing how you can uh, exploit uh, AppLocker by bypassing this type of stuff. Um, so it, it can be uh, you know, worked around. The path is you know, definitely easily exploited. So it's just saying only, only allow executables in the Windows directory or the uh, application directory to run. Let these specific executables run. Um, even if you just say these specific files are allowed to run and these are all the Windows files and all the executables that you have on your environment, um, it still can be bypassed uh, using built-in tools like PowerShell. Um, you know, the same for the file hash, but this is adding in that layer of protection to make it harder for your attacker to, to get into your environment. Uh, Windows Firewall, I won't get into too much, but uh, we, all, we all know about it, but it's a great first layer of defense to, to try to limit where uh, systems access uh, a very simple way to introduce network segmentation uh, without having to add costly networking uh, devices. Uh, this one is uh, not necessarily 
going to stop an attack, but this is a great way of detecting. Um, so this is uh, taken from the, the target breach. Uh, attackers are not going to be trying to create new users in your environment. That's incredibly noisy, and they know that they're going to get detected very quickly if they create users on either local systems or the domain. Uh, what they're going to do instead is try to take over existing accounts. So if you take the target, for an example, they take over an HVAC vendor account. Uh, that was an existing account, so there's no log saying that this new account to, to find something that uh, what they're going to do is then log into the environment with that account, and that's going to create a new folder within the C, you know, in uh, common Windows saying C users and then that username. So being able to alert on Windows uh, uh, new directories in this direct, uh, path in the environment uh, is a great uh, you know, red flag to be able to see if somebody's trying to you know, pivot across your environment using compromised credentials. And then lastly, it's looking for new services. So there's a lot of uh, uh, rage now about fileless malware and how it can be difficult to detect, uh, which is true. But if they want to have any level of persistence, they need, need, need to be able to persist across a reboot. One of the most common ways they do that is setting up new services. So something as uh, very common as is doing you know, net.exe start and output that to a file and look for new things that um, get output to that file. If that file changes at all, it should be very static even across endpoint uh, environments. So finally, you know, this is you know what the Tripwire ecosystem looks like. Um, this is you know should be common whether you're using Tripwire products or using anybody's products. Uh, just collect data from as many endpoints uh, and systems as you can, uh, correlate that data, and share that information across all all of your products uh, to be able to uh, give context across events to get a better understanding of uh, what's happening, and then have a single reporting dashboard, whether that's a uh, you know, a reporting product uh, or a SEM or a log management product, having somewhere you can have a single pane of glass to find this information uh, is going to greatly reduce your, uh, your efforts from you know, a security standpoint. So um, I want to thank everybody for, for joining me today. Um, and I'd like to you know, open up some questions today. If there's anybody having any questions, I'll, I'll open up the questions, see if you guys put anything. Uh, down throughout the podcast, but if you have any questions, please uh, submit them now, and we can um, get you the information you need. Thanks, Travis. I think a common question I was seeing is, can we get a link to the top 20 critical controls poster, which um, I can answer that. Uh, yes, there will be a follow-up email with a link um, that will have the on-demand version of the webcast and the slide deck, which includes the link to the top 20 uh, controls poster. Um, so that was a common question I was seeing. Do you have any other questions? We have just a, a few minutes. We're coming to the top of the hour. Um, I do want to thank you, Travis, for your great presentation, which showed how Tripwire covers the top uh, critical security controls. And I want to thank our audience today for uh, listening in, spending part of your busy day. Um, as I have mentioned, I will be sending out a follow-up email which will include the, all the links and the slide deck. Also, if you'd like to receive proof of attendance for the webcast, please respond to the follow-up email and we will get that for you. We hope you'll join us for future webcasts. Uh, coming up on April 20th, we will be hosting the next installment of our Tripwire University. So we hope you'll register for that event. And lastly, check out our award-winning blog, The State of Security, to read the latest in security news, as well as thought-provoking security topics. So Travis and I want to thank you and wish you a great day. <laughs>